Um, I also want to say um, and, and, and say that I have a, a warm spot in my heart for the Texas State Beekeepers because believe it or not, way back in 2001, um, you were the very first State Beekeepers Association that I ever spoke to. Uh, and I was invited by uh, um, Dr. Tanya Pankew, and uh, we had a really wonderful time. That was the very first one. 520 of these later, I'm speaking to you now, and I'm, I'm really, really pleased to see that uh, uh, Dr. Juliana Rangel has uh, taken over the B program at Texas A&M, and we're really proud of her um, and everything that you guys are doing in Texas. So I just want to uh, thank all of you and, and give a shout out to Juliana and her program. So without further ado, I'm just going to go over a little bit of some of the research that we've done on queens. This seems to be a, a, a pretty central theme in a lot of the research and extension efforts that, that we do within our program. And this is not, um, you know, by coincidence in the sense that we all know that uh, you know, the honeybee losses as determined by the, the Bee Informed Partnership surveys over the last decade or more have really shown that a good 40% of the colonies are dying off every year. And I don't, you know, don't need to preach to the choir about that. But in those same surveys, they're all, they also ask the beekeepers, well, why do you think, or what are the reasons that your, you know, colonies are, are dying off? And, you know, aside from you know, starvation or just, you know, being weak in the fall and kind of cold winters and stuff. The number one issue that beekeepers are finding, the number one biological issue, I would say, um, is queen failure. This, this is even higher than uh, varroa as a, as a purported reason for why um, colonies are having problems. And so this is a very significant where 20 to 25% of colonies are having these queen issues. Um, and so anything that we can do to improve the quality and the longevity of queens can go a long way to helping us as beekeepers. And so um, to underscore just how important the, the quality of queens are, this is just one of several studies that, that we have done where we're looking at one very specific measure of queen quality, and that is her mating number, how many drones that she mated with and then therefore are siring her worker offspring. That's what's on the x-axis here. And then on the y-axis, we we're following 80 plus colonies over the course of a year in these migratory operations. And um, the majority of those queens didn't even live an entire year. <laughs> but those that did were three times, th those that mated with seven or more drones were three times more likely to survive that year than uh, those that mated less than that. And so, you know, mating number and the consequence of genetic diversity seems to be very, very important, even in kind of these noisy systems of, of migratory commercial beekeeping operations. So queen quality is really, really important for many different reasons. And so this led us then to ask a, kind of a very simple question and to step back and say, well, what do we mean by queen quality, right? Now, a lot of beekeepers, you know, they look at the queens, oh, she's so nice and yellow. No, that's not what we mean. The, 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 you know, how nice looking the queen is, is irrelevant. What we're talking about are the factors of the queen that actually translate and make her a better queen within the colony. And so we can break those down into kind of three buckets, three different categories of the queen herself that makes her better to lead the colony. The first is her physical quality. Um, so this is not just her body size, where as we'll see, um, larger queens are actually better, uh, but also if she's parasitized. Uh, Dr. Ramsey just went over a really nice um, overview of the inquilines uh, and the molidophiles that live within colonies, as well as the parasites within colonies. And so not all of them infect queens, but many of them can. And so, you know, uh, how does that parasitism potentially affect how good the queen is? But then it's not just her body size, but it's also who she mates with. That's the other genetic half of the colony in the workers that, um, that she then, then uh, produces. 
And so the insemination quality is really important. So how much sperm does she have within that sperm storage organ, the spermatheca, which directly uh, determines how many eggs she can lay and fertilize within her lifetime. But then also the viability of that sperm that's stored in the spermatheca, because she could have a, a spermatheca full of sperm, but if it's all dead, she's not a very good queen, right? And then finally, as I kind of was just alluding to, not just the amount of sperm, but who she acquires that sperm from, where you know some re previous research has shown that an increase in the number of drones with which she mates can really have profound consequences on, on how, how good that colony becomes, right? So there's no one answer to this, you know, what makes a, a good queen good. It's all of these things together. And so uh, the studies that we have done have tried to answer that in this multifaceted way. And what's really nice about honeybees and apiculture is that there's a very long and rich history in the published literature that we can go back on to see where the baseline was. If queens aren't as good today, right? Well, let's look back to see, well, how good were they back in the day when they supposedly were better? And, you know, compare today versus back then to see which of these measures is kind of falling off a cliff, which is these measures is, is really showing a red flag as to being a potential problem. And so we can go all the way back to the 1940s, believe it or not, to, to look at certain publications that have measured queen quality in some way. And so we'll just kind of go over some of these in turn. The way that we went about doing these experiments was that we were, uh, we were anonymous, right? So what we did is we just went into ABJ and B culture and, and kind of randomly found um, different advertisements of, of uh, beekeepers that were selling queens, both large and small, both east and west coast. Um, and then we would, we would order them. And rather than saying, hey, we're NC State doing an experiment to see how good your queens are, we, we got some undergrad who was in the lab at the time to use his own personal visa card that we then reimbursed him for the queens and they were shipped to his house so that it was just like what any other beekeeper would be buying. There was no, no way that the, the queen producers could really know this. And then we measured these queens. We um, put them through the chop shop as it were, where we would measure them for their physical insemination and mating health. Um, to answer this important question, you know, what are beekeepers buying from commercially produced, um, you know, queen producers? And so first we'll, we'll start with the physical quality of queens. So, you know, we measured all sorts of different aspects of the queen's, you know, size in essence, um, their weight, the, the width of their thorax, the, that middle section, their head width, their wing lengths, uh, and so on and so forth. And what this, um, chart right here really shows is A, there's a lot of variation among the queens, and B, that they were all highly correlated. That is, heavier queens tend to be wider, and it's kind of like no duh, right? But it just shows that the overall body size um, tends to be consistent, but there's still a lot of variation uh, among the queens, okay? So let's just look at, at the weights of queens across the different producers. All these different producers are blindly coded um, because, well, I'll say why in a moment, but you know, to respect their uh, anonymity. And then each of these shows kind of the distribution and the weights um, it, it measured in milligrams here, where you know you had light queens and, and heavy queens and a lot of variation in between. And so the point that I want you to take away here, as far as kind of the physical quality of queens, the, the, the body size of queens, is that it's not that, you know, one producer is doing a good job and they have really heavy and, you know, big queens. And then another producer is doing a very poor job and they're, all of their queens are really runty. No, there's no differences among the producers that we, that we surveyed. They're in, in all cases, some had really, really good queens and others had some dogs in there. And, you know, you, it's, you can't really go in and say, well, this is the operation that's doing best and therefore those are the queens I need to buy. No, they're all producing um, equivalently sized queens and doing a good job. 
but there's a lot of variation in queens and there's no guarantee when it comes to biology. And so we just have to realize that um, and can't expect the best out of everybody, right? Um, and so uh, another thing that we did with these queens when it came to size was that we dissected out their ovaries. So um, the ovaries here, these are some pictures of the dissected ovaries. And here, all the little bundled tubules called ovarioles are kind of splayed out like little spaghetti strands. Um, and there you can see that the, each individual ovariole is the thing that produces an egg, right? So it goes from a very small cell and it grows and it grows and it grows until it gets to the end and you see the fully mature eggs that are just ready to be laid, right? So the idea is that the number of ovarioles is therefore a good indication of how many eggs a queen can lay per unit time or her fecundity. And a good quality queen, research has shown, is that each ovary is supposed to have about 150 to 180 ovarioles. Put that into contrast with uh, workers that still have reduced ovaries they have like three to six ovarioles in each ovary, right? So queens are incredibly well fecund in that way. And so we teamed up with um, Dr. Susan Farbach who does this kind of stuff usually on bee brains, but in this case there were ovaries. And we took these ovaries and we kind of took these very um, thin cross sections of the ovaries and, and counted all the little circles of these cross sections, which is the number of ovarioles. So we were able to count up the number of ovarioles. And we found that only seven and a half percent of the queens had fewer than 250, um, which I wouldn't even say is 250 total, right? So a, a good quality queen should have at least 300. 250 is maybe a bit low, but still not too shabby compared to workers at least. So, you know, there doesn't seem to be a problem with the queen's abilities to lay eggs. Let's put it that way. Another thing that we showed actually, I'll just do this very briefly, um, where you've heard this term vitelligenin. Uh, Dr. Ramsey has done some really nice work uh, on vitelligenin and uh, the fat bodies within uh, workers and queens. And it's the main egg yolk precursor. It's the thing that tends to nourish those eggs as they grow to make them better. And believe it or not, not all eggs are the same. You, have, you can have small runty eggs and you can have very large, well-provisioned eggs. And vitelligenin is that protein that tends to do that. Um, what we found here is that the, the vitelligenin um, uh, production factory of the protein tends to be turned on more as, um, as the queens get heavier and as the queens are laying eggs. So it's not just that bigger queens are better and they have more ovarioles so they can produce more eggs, they're nourishing their eggs more qualitatively. And so those eggs are actually better in the end as well. So that's a, a kind of an interesting trend as well. But nonetheless, um, compared to historical measures, looking back to uh, previous studies, there doesn't seem to be a, a significant diminishment. In fact, there might even be kind of an uptick in the quality of queens produced commercially. So, well, maybe there's something going on with their diseases. As you well know, queens can be parasitized by nosema as well as um, uh, tracheomites. Uh, these, the tracheomites are not nearly as much of a problem as they were when they first arrived in the 1980s. But nosema, we have a new nosema uh, uh, um, species, right? And so how do these, potentially affect queen quality. Well, these were measured back in the past and it seems that, you know, back in the day, if you would order queens, a good 10% of them would come laden with nosema. And then after tracheomites arrived, a good, you know, 20 to 30% of those queens came with tracheomites when you purchase them, right? So maybe these levels are off the charts today, which is, explains why we're having such problems. The long and the short of it is, is that of all of the queens that we measured, we didn't find a single one with nosema. This was so shocking to me, because again, we were expecting about 10% or so, that um, we went back and double checked the spore counts and then didn't believe that either, because it's hard to believe a negative 
And so we then went and did genetic analyses on these just to make sure. And again, none of these queens had Nosema. And I think this is because a lot of the commercial queen producers had seen these results and knew that Nosema could be a problem with queens. And so they were feeding uh, uh, fum fumagillin and, and other things to the mating nukes and stuff so that the queens were coming out very clean, right? And again, just like the rest of uh, you know bees in the U.S., tracheomites are not nearly as much of a problem. So we only found only about two and a half percent with very light infestations of tracheomites in the trachea. Compared to the previous surveys, though, we did some other pathogens and parasites that infect queens that had never been done before, and that is viruses. Um, and so we, we looked at all of these different viruses. I won't go through them all at all um, as well, but guess what? The number one virus that was most prevalent in the queens was deformed wing virus, which is practically you know, ubiquitous at certain levels, but none of the viruses tended to correlate at all with any of the other measures, right? So it wasn't like um, virally infected queens had low sperm counts or something like that. So um, they did have viruses, um, perhaps not as much as what, what you might do in a survey of workers because they get parasitized by varroa, whereas queens do not. But nonetheless, they, they are there, but they don't seem to really be affecting their quality at all, at least as far as we know right now. So again, it doesn't seem that disease seems to be the major player and indicator of why our queen quality has gone down in the last few decades. So maybe it has to do with their mating success, their insemination success. So we looked at the sperm counts of the queens. You do this by dissecting out the spermatheca, which is this spherical organ that's in the back tail of her abdomen. And it gets filled up, the more and more that she mates, it gets filled up going from kind of this clear empty uh, sphere to this whitish to then this um, tan marbled color that the spermatheca has. You dissect that out, you rupture the sperm into solution as we do right here. And then we're able to stain the nuclei of those sperm so that we can count them well and very easily under a microscope. So they fluoresce um, like this, like kind of this starry sky, right? Where all, each one of these little dots is a, is a nucleus of a, of a sperm. And we know from previous research that a well-mated queen has, you know, between seven, uh, five to seven million sperm. That's the estimate. Um, and in the past, research has used this cutoff, this line of three million or less of newly mated queens are considered poorly mated. Right, so all of these queens that we're measuring here, just like all these other studies, are newly mated queens that you purchase, you know, from commercially. And so anywhere between 11, 19, and 29 percent of queens in the past, you would get, and they would have less than three million sperm. So what do we find today? Well, we found an average of about four million sperm. Only about 19% of the queens that we found were below that kind of 3 million level of poorly mated, okay? Um, but about 81% uh, of them were below that kind of ideal of 5 million or more. So you can take that for what it is in the sense that, well, maybe they weren't completely tanked up, but at the same time, compared to the past, in fact, the, the last one was done by Scott Camazine and, and others at, at Penn State in 1998, the exact same number. So there doesn't seem to be this kind of falling off the cliff where queens aren't mating enough, they're not filling up with enough sperm. So this can't be the reason why queens aren't doing as well as they used to. This then leaves the last thing that we were looking at and that is the mating frequency. It's not just the amount of sperm, but the number of drones that contribute to her sperm count. And the only way to do that, or I should say the easiest way to do that, is by taking the worker offspring and doing molecular studies on them to see who their daddy is, right? Um, now, I should note that this has never been done before in commercial, commercial mating populations. In fact, it wasn't even known that queens mated with more than one drone until the 1960s. <laughs> Um, and so this has never really been uh, done before, so we don't really have a good baseline. But we do know 
that queens are supposed to mate with an average of about 12 plus drones. That, that's what we know. And again, the way to do this is you take a queen, she's already mated with drones, you know, any number of drones. And then as they sire their worker offspring, they form these different subfamilies within the colonies that we can detect using genetic markers, right? It's just like a paternity test, right? For, um, uh, for like a court of law or something like that, right? And so you can then kind of count up the number of subfamilies that equates to the number of drones that the queen mated with. And so what we found was that the average number of drones that the queens mated with was about 15, but not all drones were siring um, the workers at an equal rate, right? There's kind of skews and in, in, you know, some drones make more workers, other drones make fewer workers. And so when you account for that, um, that weight, uh, account for the, the relative uh, weight of the different drones, the effective mating number of these queens was 12 which is exactly what you would expect. <laughs> so we went into this trying to find that smoking gun, right? Okay, we're going to find the one thing of why queens aren't as good as they used to. It's probably because they're not mating with enough drones. And all we have to do is tell commercial queen producers to put more drones out there and all of our queen problems will be solved. And that didn't happen. We were not able to find a smoking gun as to why queens are not as good as they used to. So um, that's, you know, kind of frustrating, but it's also part of science. That also means, well, there's something else going on um, that we don't know about. It's not this low hanging fruit, it's something else. And so we started doing some other studies to say, okay, well, if the commercial queens that are being produced are of relatively high quality, how, what, what, is, what makes a bad queen bad, right? And so, um, this is where uh, we teamed up with Juliana Rangel um, and Jennifer Keller at our, uh, our apiculture technician here at NC State. And we've known for a very long time, since the 1970s, that if you start to raise a queen when she's really, really young, as a really young larva, then she makes a very good queen because she's fed royal jelly the whole time. But if you graft a, an older queen, like this two-day-old larva, and graft her, then she's not gonna be as good. In other words, if you take the same you know, hatched egg and you feed it royal jelly the entire time, it becomes a perfectly good queen. But if you graft a worker larva at you know, different ages, then that larva has been fed a uh, kind of non-royal jelly diet for one or two or three days. But then once you start raising it, uh, feeding it royal jelly, it'll develop into a queen, but it'll be more worker-like, right? So then if you never feed it royal jelly, it becomes a worker. But you can get these inner casts here if you graft older larvae. This is why we tell beekeepers that want to raise their own queens, you always want to graft the larvae that are so small you can't see them, right? Because you want those youngest possible larvae. This is another way to look at it. Um, if you graft, um, you know, newly hatched larvae, they are uh, the, the, the females that are produced by that are of high reproductive quality. We know them as queens. If you um, never feed them royal jelly, then they become workers. But if you graft them at um, one day, two days, up to three and a half days, you will get these inner casts. So it's, it's more of this continuum between workers and queens, not these two discrete things, but you get an inner cast where they're, they're more worker-like queens or more queen-like workers, right? And so what we did is we made the best possible queens we could, grafting the youngest larvae that we could, and then we graft the oldest larvae that we could to make the crappiest queens that we could, in order to maximize this, this difference between good and, and bad queens. So we experimentally raised them um, and then had them you know, emerge and mate and everything else. And then we measured them for all of those other measures of queen quality that we talked about earlier. And that's what's shown here and their relationship. So this, this is just where the more red it is, the more highly correlated they are with each other. So again, heavier queens are wider, um, bigger queens mate more, 
right? So these are all the same um, kinds of relationships that we knew, but here now we have the maximum difference between the two. And so what we can do is collapse all of those different variables, the head width and the, the weight and the sperm count and sperm viability and all these other things. And we can collapse them down into a single variable that we call reproductive quality. Now I know that um, there are three kinds of dishonest people. You have liars, damn liars, and statisticians, okay? But believe me that we can statistically account for all of these different variables and collapse them down into one. And that's what we have here, this thing that we call quality, where it goes from low to high, all in just kind of one vector. And so now, because we've produce the worst queens we could and the best queens we could. We have these, uh, these bounds of queen quality, these biological bounds from bad to good, right? And then we can then take these commercial queens that we've measured and we can statistically collapse them down and put them on the same ruler, the same measuring stick, right? And so, if, if the, the, the top of this measure stick is the highest queen quality, that gets an A, and the lowest on this, uh, on this uh, measuring stick is an F, the question is, well, where do these commercial queens tend to lie? And the answer is that the commercial queens that we just randomly purchased and measured empirically gets a B plus. So, this is, this is good news in many ways. One is that it's not an F, right? That the commercial queens are not the main reason, that the, the commercial queens are not of such low quality that that's the reason why we're having queen problems. It's something else. But there's also room for improvement. And so we've been working with a lot of commercial queen producers to try to improve that grade and to try to do some of the things that are within their ability to try and, um, ensure that uh, the, the quality of the queens that they're producing are as high as possible. Right. So um, this is what then led us to uh, our honeybee queen and disease clinic. So um, a direct uh, offshoot of a lot of this research was that we now provide these same uh, measurement techniques, these same bioassays and, and process of measuring queens uh, where we then offer it to uh, beekeepers and, and queen producers. And so actually my next talk is gonna be about that. So just um, hold on to that and just remember that we'll talk about the entire process, but it's all based on our empirical research. I just wanna make that clear. So to conclude this section of, of our discussion here, um, it seems that the queen issues that beekeepers are having, premature drone laying, um, they don't live nearly as long as they used to. Um, early supersedure, right? All of these issues are kind of lumped together and it remains a top issue for beekeepers. But these commercially produced queens seem to be of sufficiently high reproductive quality compared to the past. So what this means is that we need to identify the, you know, not the low hanging fruit, but the higher hanging fruit to identify the mechanisms that affect queen quality, both upstream to mating and downstream from when you receive them. So what I mean by that is things like who the queens are mating with, right? Like that could have an effect on her uh, downstream reproductive quality or the environment in which the queens are placed could have a profound influence on her quality. Um, and therefore that may, uh, affect her quality. You think it's the queen, but maybe it's actually the environment. Right? So I'm just going to go through a few of the, of the studies and, and paradigms that we've been um, looking at, particularly in the down, downstream effects. Well, this is actually kind of an upstream effect. Looking at the, um, the possibility and, well, the, the high probability that uh, pesticides affect queens. Uh, but the question is, is I mean, you can, you can apply a pesticide to a bee or a queen, and at a high enough dose, it's going to have, you know, a problem. The question is, at the doses that queens and colonies tend to be exposed to, and in the combinations of different pesticides that they have within their colony matrices, 
does that have an effect on queens and their quality? And so this is a PhD project by um, a recent graduate uh, at NC State, Joe Malone. He's now um, working in the EPA up in Washington, DC. But what he did is rather than kind of looking at each individual pesticide one by one and you know, doing dose response curves and all that stuff that normally toxicologists do, we took it the other approach and say, okay, well, there have been studies that have looked to see what kind of pesticides tend to be in different B matrices. <laughs> Let's just take that mixture of six to nine, you know, different pesticides that tends to be found within colonies and then expose the queens to them. So this is the entire exposome. So lots of different chemicals and, and pesticides at the same time, because that's a realistic uh, um, test of what queens are going through. And he did so by looking at both the pesticides that um, researchers have found in pollen or, or in bee bread, and then the pesticides that have been found in wax. There's not a lot of overlap um, in those, but you know, he made up pollen patties that were either free of or had a mixture of these different compounds, these different pesticides. And then he did the same thing in wax. So we raise queens in little queen cups. That's what they're doing here. They're making up um, either clean or pesticide laden queen cups in which we grafted the queens. All right. So it's kind of this two by two design. And then we took those queens, we reared them, we put them in mating nukes, we let them mate normally, we measured some of them for their kind of mating success and all of the things that we've already been talking about. And then others we let go to see how good their colonies be, are <laughs> um, downstream. So what are the kind of the downstream consequences of their rearing environment? Okay. And so what we found um, was very surprising in many ways. And this stuff is just coming out. So I'm only just giving a very, very brief summary here. But in essence, the wax, right? So if, if the, uh, if, if it was clean wax, we had very good grafting take, right? We have high percentages of the queens that would be reared from a larva to adulthood, okay? But if they were in um, pesticide-laden wax, the percentages went way down. So we didn't raise nearly as many queens, but the queens that did emerge seemed to be totally, um, uh, still have high reproductive quality. <laughs> So they didn't have a huge effect on the overall reproductive quality, but affected the, the take, right? The grafting take. Contrast that with the uh, pollen treatment. So queens that were raised in pollen that was contaminated with a, a, a mixture of different pesticides, they were all um, accepted and reared at the same rate, but the queens that emerged from those cells that were in those colonies that uh, were exposed to pesticides had lower reproductive quality. They had lower sperm counts, they were smaller, they didn't um, mate as many times, um, uh, roughly. And so that was very interesting. Um, but a thing that, the thing that Joe did was that he also took um, samples of the pollen, both the clean and the contaminated, and the wax, clean and contaminated wax, as well as the royal jelly from the cells, that he, some of which he sacrificed, and he sent them off to get analyzed for the amount of pesticides in them. And what we found was shocking is that in the royal jelly of the pesticide-laden you know, colonies that were exposed to pesticides, there was barely any of those pesticides in the royal jelly. Yet, the queens that were raised in that environment were of lower reproductive quality. So it seems that the exposure of these colonies to these different pesticides can result in low queen quality, but it's not a direct effect of the poisoning of the queens by having pesticide-laden royal jelly. The workers are kind of filtering that out, right? They're synthesizing royal jelly rather than just feeding the pollen directly. Right? So instead, what seems to be happening is that those nurse bees that are feeding on this contaminated pollen, their hyperpharyngeal glands aren't probably as good and the, and the royal jelly that they're feeding was both um, quantitatively and qualitatively less. So the queens produced 
are not as good, but it's not because they were poisoned necessarily, but it's because of the workers, the nurse bees weren't as good. Does that make sense? So it just shows how complicated all of this can be, but even these indirect routes and effects of chemical exposure can be uh, really profound at the queen and the colony level. So another study that we did looking at a completely different uh, environmental stressor rather than pesticides, we were looking at temperature. So there's been a lot of work recently, um, uh, and this is a good example, uh, Jeff Pettis et al. published a paper in 2016 or 2016 that really opened a lot of eyes, right? What he and his colleagues had shown was that when um, queens overheat, right, in packages or when they're shipped in the mail, these newly mated queens, well, you know, when you overheat bees, they die. And we know that, right? So um, we overcompensate by making sure they have a lot of airflow and they get cooled because we know that bees, when they cool down, they cluster and they, they can um, retain heat and even generate heat if they need to. And so, you know, we overcompensate and, and, and have these packages or, or battery boxes or whatever shipped, you know, kind of so that they're cool so they don't overheat. Well, what he showed is that if queens get chilled, the queens survive, but the sperm in their spermatheca dies or, or can die at a higher rate. So over chilling queens is also not a good thing. So temperature during shipment and during transport can be really, really critical. And so uh, what we did here is we, we um, teamed up with a, a commercial beekeeper in North Carolina and he was ordering 400 packages to be driven up um, from Georgia. And so we went down there with him and on a hundred of the queens that were placed into those packages, we put these little thermal probes on their, on their cages so that we could track their temperature profile or what they were exposed to temperature wise during transit. We did this two subsequent years. And so what we found is that as they were in transit, which is what this little video here is showing, is that in this kind of three-dimensional cube of those loads on the trucks, we were expecting that the outside queens were gonna get chilled, right? Because they're most exposed. Whereas the queens and the packages on the inside were gonna be kind of insulated and therefore they would be warmer. And then when we hived them up, we could track their success or failure and match it up with the temperature, right? But instead what we found was that there was kind of hot and cold queens everywhere. <laughs> um, the blue is more cold, the red is, is more hot. Um, and it didn't really seem to, to be a function of where they were on the load per se. And that just shows that they're getting a lot of airflow. But it kind of makes me question, well, why are some of these queens kind of ignored or not well warmed by the workers and others are, right? So. Um, that's kind of a side note. But as we, as we hive these up and we track these queens over time, what we found is that 25% of the queens were either not accepted or failed within the first eight, eight weeks. So the first two months, a quarter of these queens were gone and done, okay? Which if you've ordered a lot of packages and you've done this is probably not all that surprising. This is kind of typical where this commercial beekeeper um, ordered, you know, a um, hundred extra queens to requeen those colonies that he knew he was going to lose, right? But what's interesting about this is that um, the temperature between their uh, the survival and the temperature, it didn't seem that the ones that failed were either overheated or overchilled. Um, and so it wasn't temperature that was driving this kind of failure rate. It was something else. Not that, I mean, temperature is important for sperm viability and, and queen quality. But in this study over these two years, it really wasn't driving the reason why they failed. Um, so it's temperature plus many other things that we don't know about yet, right? So I think it's important to realize that. But the take home from this is, you, you want to have your queens handled very well. You don't want to overcompensate and to prevent overheating by overchilling. You want to 
keep queens nice and warm, somewhere between brood nest temperature and room temperature, right? Somewhere between 75 degrees and, and 95 degrees. Um, that's best for your queens at all time. If you're installing queens and you're wearing a winter jacket, probably not awesome, right? So just remember that. Some other stuff that we've been doing, um, and I'll just try to wrap up here quickly and do a, a, a brief overview of some of these others. Um, we teamed up with uh, Mike Simone Finstrom when he was a postdoc here in the lab. He's now at Baton Rouge, the USDA lab there, and uh, Tim Links Bayer uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Tim and, and others have done some, some really interesting things of, of raising bees in vitro. That is, not inside the hive, but rather in the incubator, in, in petri dishes. Um, so I, I like to say that these are test tube babies, but that's usually has grown. So I can't hear any of you grown. So that's a good thing. But anyway, we can raise queens, or really bees, from grafting to adulthood, all in an incubator, all outside of the environment. And so again, if you try to raise bees inside a hive, you get these two polar ends of a continuum, the workers, which are low reproductive you know, quality, and the queens, which are of high reproductive quality. But if you remove the social environment and you just raise them in an incubator, you get all of these things in between. You get all of these inner casts, right? Because you don't have that social control. And so some of the studies that we've been doing and looking at well, are there different genetic types of bees that are more prone to becoming better queens than workers? We call this queenliness, right? So here we are looking at, um, you know, Carniolans, Russians, Italians, Minnesota Hygienics, VSH, and we're measuring these, these in vitro reared queens and the huge amount of variation that they have to see, well, is some of these stocks more prone at making better queens than others, right? And we did see some, right? That there's a lot of variation, there's more variation kind of within a stock than there is among them, but there is potential here that there is some genetic control and some genetic traits that could be fostered to make better queens better, right? Um, some other things that we did, again, looking in vitro rearing queens. Here we did, uh, teamed up with a uh, uh, Klaus Hartfelder down in Brazil, Diana D'Souza, who's a uh, postdoc with us, but now um, at Cornell, and Ming Wong, who now works for um, Eurofins, but he was a postdoc in the lab as well, um, where not just the idea of, of how to make queens um, good and bad, but how to make queens best, <laughs> better than they actually are in nature. And so this is really all Ming's idea, where um, you, know, you can take a queen both in vitro as well as in a colony, and you can add certain elements to the royal jelly at just the right time, which is about the third instar or so of development. And if you add juvenile hormone and a, a mix of different sugars, this can create queens of higher reproductive quality than what the bees were making themselves. So we can make super queens <laughs> they're, where they're about 10 to 15% bigger and more fecund than the highest quality queens that we can raise without those supplements. Um, so we have a lot more work to do because we don't know if, you know, these super queens are actually better in the long run in the sense that, well, what if they're so big they can't fit their abdomens in the cell to lay eggs, right? Something like that. So don't go out and try this right away. More research needs to be done, but it does give a lot of potential that we may be able to make, you know, really, really high quality queens just if we change our grafting strategy a little bit. And then finally, I wanna end with a, another phenotype and trait of queens that is really, really fancy and new. And, and really, um, it's, in the, it's in a lot of the, the popular press and media, and that is the microbiome, right? We're all eating probiotics and yogurt and all of these things because we have a much better understanding now that the bacteria, the beneficial bacteria in our gut, 
can have a profound effect on us and our health, right? The same is true in bees. And there's been a lot of studies that have looked at the microbiome of, of honeybees, but all of them up until our study had looked at workers and not at queens. And so the way we went into this is, oh, well, we're taking you know, a queen from this colony environment and throwing her in this other colony environment. And this colony has this kind of microbiome and, and this colony has a different microbiome and maybe they're incompatible. So when you, you transfer from this colony to this colony and she's not accepted, it's because of that, right? That every hive has its own unique microbiome just like we do. And, and as a result, th there may be some incompatibilities, not with the queens per se, but she just doesn't smell right or her gut, gut microbes aren't correct, right? And so we did that where we looked at the, the gut microbiomes of the larvae, um, as well as the workers within those cell builders. And then when we put the queens into the mating nukes and the workers in those mating nukes, and then as we introduce them into yet another colony, both before and after her own offspring um, were hatching out, right? And then compared the queens to the workers all along the way. And so a couple things that we found from this is first of all, this idea that each hive has its own unique microbiome blend, totally wrong. Workers seem like all the colonies pretty much had very a high consistency of their gut microbiomes. Okay, so that's one take home. The other is that it was night and day between workers and queens. If you look at this last panel, these different pie charts and the different colors represent different microbes. I'm not going to tell you about them, but the queens have far fewer and dominated by these uh, this one type rather than this diverse um, suite of bacteria in the workers. So um, queens are like queens and workers are like workers and there's not a, lot, not a lot of variation among them. So that's another thing. So there's still a lot of more work that needs to be done when it comes to this, but this kind of simple idea that there's this kind of incompatibility of the microbiomes um, from one colony to the next is probably not what's driving this, but it again may have other profound consequences on the quality of queens. And so with that, I hope I haven't run over my time, but I just um, wanted to thank all of the folks that were involved in, in these studies. I, I thanked most of them as we went along, as well as the funding support, mostly by the USDA, but also by the US uh, Army Research Lab, National Honey Board, uh, many different state um, beekeeping organizations, including California beekeepers. And I wanna thank you for your attention. Be happy to take questions. Woohoo! Thank you, Dr. Tarpey. Um, so just so you know, on the side, between emails, text messages, and the chat window, um, everybody was getting a big kick out of talking about big queens. Uh, I got lots of emojis of booty shaking and other things that may or may not be appropriate, but uh, it was well received for sure. Um, so we do have some questions. We've had the attendees going through and voting everything up, the ones that they would like to hear the most. So okay. starting off, the one with the highest votes comes from Gene, and it says, is there an advantage to acquiring bees from a local source versus from other states? I am in Texas, but last year I got my bees from Georgia. Yeah, that's a great, great question, Gene. And um, I had hidden some slides for the, uh, for the focus of time. I might introduce them in my next talk this afternoon uh, since you asked that. Um, we've also done tests, uh, genetic tests on looking at these different populations of queens um, that are ordered in different places. And in essence, um, there's not a whole lot of genetic difference among them. Because we're shipping queens, you know, all over the US, we're buying stock, you know, from Hawaii and, you know, all of this, genetically, they're all mixed up. Right, so there is no such thing as a local genetic type, right? Um, you can get local queens in the sense that they were raised and mated locally in, in nearby vicinity, but genetically, Texas queens are not much different, if at all different, from Georgia queens. Well, we're, we're just kind of one big panmictic genetic population because of the way that we move genetic material around. So that's that's um, impressive. I wouldn't yeah. have guessed that actually. Um, yeah, 
Um, so, so I wouldn't worry about that. But you know, what I always say is um, every, everything is so parochial to our own beekeeping operation. So if you liked those queens and they work for you and they did well, then keep using them. <laughs> but if they didn't work well, um, then try something else, right? There's tons of other options. And so, um, so much of what we do as beekeepers is trial and error, but um, there, there isn't going to be any um, kind of parochial nature of Georgia queens not doing well in, um, in Texas, no. Genetic. Well, that, that potentially actually answers the, uh, the next question that was up there by Justin, which was that um, were there any geographic correlations or was the data set too small to do a reasonable comparison? So if you found that everything from all the areas is very similar, then that kind of would be irrelevant as far as your location. Um, and the data set was too small. <laughs> and the data set so, was too yes. small. Okay. So in order to, to truly answer that question, we would have to do a much, much higher kind of resolution of those, um, which I would like to do, but we haven't. So as, as far as we can tell, there doesn't seem to be um, a strong signal of geography. Again, and it makes sense because we're just swapping genetic material all over the place. Now that's in the commercial stock, right? Um, and that's why I think um, studies that are looking at feral populations that are not managed by people, they can have different genetic signals and they could be a potential genetic um, reservoir of genetic material. Now, whether or not they are truly adapted, that is they do better there than anywhere else, that those tests have not been done, but at least that might give the potential that that's true. Very so good. should I just keep going through these? Um, so Car uh, Carol has a question here. Seeing that the queen producers who have queens more highly inseminated are those that would have a higher number of hives, thus providing a wider range of drones to do the inseminating. That's true, um, that you need a, uh, a sufficient drone, local mating population, right, with queens. So, um, but I think what has been shown is that, you know, for every one queen, there's about 8,000 drones that are raised by your average colony, right? So um, the numerical advantage of, or the numerical sex ratio between queens and drones makes it such that even if there aren't a huge number of colonies around, queens still tend to find enough drones and mate with a sufficient number of drones. The problem is that if a queen mates with all brothers, then genetically the colony isn't as diverse as if she mates with all unrelated drones. And as a result, the colony might not do as well, right? So I think both of those things are true that um, you don't need thousands of drone producing colonies to mate with queens, but the, the more different that those drone colonies are, the better, if that makes sense. Um, another question here uh, from Marcus, for those of you who raise queens, are there any observational cues to their quality? Um, such as short fat queens versus long skinny queens or long skinny abdens. Damn, I wish there were. I wish, I wish there were. Um, I think um, if like, so, so one of the things that we're trying to work with, but again, it's really, really hard because all of these measures are destructive, right? We have to kill the queens in order to measure these things. And so we get these things, it's like, oh, this is an A plus queen, too bad she's dead, right? We can't send them back to you to use them. Um, but the, the, if there was one thing that is non-destructive that could hopefully hedge your bets, right? Is uh, measuring the width of the queens, that is, right at the thorax, right at where the wings integrate into the, the, their cuticular you know, um, body, if you take some very, very fine calibers, calipers and you measure that and you can cull those that are skinniest, um, that is probably the best way to hedge your bets. So, if you think of you know, the bell-shaped curve of queens that you produce, Marcus, if you can cull that left tail 
they, those are going to be the, the smallest ones that are going to mate fewer. And, you know, though, if you could kind of call those, that will help increase your average, right? Now, again, it's not, um, it's not a hard and fast rule in the sense that there are some skinny queens that do just great, right? It's not a guarantee, but it just helps to hedge your bets just a little bit. Um, so, and that's the most reliable measure, weight, and the abdomen size and things like that tends to be a lot more noisy um, than the thorax width, which never changes, whether she's mating, laying, or what. So I, I, would, I would do that. Um, uh, how many more can I do here, by the way? Just tell I me when to- good. Okay, tell yeah, me when to I, shut up. Um, okay. Here's one from Justin. Uh, have any studies been done on pheromone activity levels and success rates? Um, thinking of some writings and the unintended consequences, selective breeding, but oh, that, that's a great point. So um, again, in collaboration with Dr. Rangel at now at Texas A&M, we took those same high and low quality queens that we made, so the best queens we could and the worst queens we could, and then looked at their pheromone profiles. We actually teamed up with some um, pheromone chemists because we can't do this, that's way too sophisticated for us. Um, and what we found was that the, the QMP um, parts of that blend did indeed change a little bit. So there is probably a signature in the queen's pheromones if they're of low reproductive quality. Now, how significant that is, the, the, the differences in that were very subtle. So it wasn't like this kind of night and day change. They're still producing QMP. Queen mandibular pheromone. Um, it's just that you know some of the ratios might have been a little off, and the quantities might have been a little down. Um, and it's also been shown that what prompts supersedure is not a diminishment of the amount of Q queen mandibular pheromone that the queen is producing. So that can explain why they're being superseded more and those kind of problems. Um, but it does have a little bit of an effect. Um, but I think your point what there was about the unintended consequences of selective breeding that we might be passively breeding queens that aren't producing as much pheromone overall. Um, and that's perhaps true in something that we couldn't detect, um, but that has not yet been studied. That that's a really, really good point that there probably is unintended consequences of the way that we're producing mass producing queens um, in the US and we need to uh, hopefully make sure that we're not um, shooting ourselves in the foot. 